Good afternoon. My name is Michał Wiśniewski. I represent the International Cultural Center and I will have this privilege to uh, moderate the last session of this afternoon. Uh, the one that will bring us to the conclusions of this very conference. But before we will start this very session, uh, I would like to ask the moderators of the workshop to come to the table and to give us the remarks concerning the discussion in the groups. Uh, this workshop was divided into three groups, so I would like to invite uh, Beatrice Kelly, I would like to invite Gabor Szonkoli, and I would like to invite Marek Świdrak uh, for the uh, brief presentation of the outcomes and results of this very discussion. One information in the beginning, it was our suggestion concerning how we should be split, how we should be divided into groups. I hope you found this proposal uh, interesting and useful. And now I would like to pass the voice. Uh, at first I would like to start with batteries if you could uh, tell us about your observations concerning this discussion. Um, well, we had a very fruitful discussion, I, I hope the group felt. Um, we took the idea of uh, doing a sort of SWOT analysis on the, the scheme um, and talking also about individual sites and then tried to look at maybe a vision sort of in five years' time. So the strengths that were identified, um, that in a way the label, for receiving the label for, for sites really opens up your horizons. Um, and that at the same hand, it also helps sort of promote obviously the ideas around Europe and integration, but it is a real chance both to showcase your site um, on an international stage, as well as um, broadening your own thinking about what your site is, where it is, and how, how you're running it. Um, another strength was cited was actually the support of the Commission on this, and that that was important. Um, it was also said that the label brings Europe closer together, it makes it smaller, um, that the sites are tangible links um, to, from people to place, and it sort of gives a sense of pulling ourselves t together. Um, the whole networking side was, came up many times as a, a great strength and very much this idea that while there are only 38 sites, the synergy between the sites um, and the sort of the, the sum of all the parts is far greater than just the 38. So as it grows, it'll get even stronger. It was felt there was great potential to grow and that also there was potential for financial support as well um, and that we, we should try and, there was great potential to, to strengthen the European dimension. There was also on a site-by-site -site basis, um, the label gives greater status to a site that might in turn help it get better support um, from national authorities. So in some ways you go out to get support at home and I'm sure that's something we, we, we're all familiar with. On another level, it was felt that the label could allow um, a chance to share ideas around running cultural heritage businesses, really, not just sort of in, in the commercial sense, but that all the different problems we have on site management are things that, that um, is a strength uh, within the network. Um, and that there were new, on the opportunity side, there were a lot of ideas coming forward about, say, an international trail um, that we could have, and that the label also is a way to overcome possibly current political situations or changes. European heritage is um, both European um, as opposed to the Commission and that was a distinction that came up over and over again and that in a way it could be a constant as borders and politics change around us. 
Um, on the weakness side, um, it was felt that the lack of recognition that has come up several times um, over the past couple of days, the lack of leadership um, from the parties involved, such as both the Commission and the Parliament, um, is a weakness, um, that we're unable to make more of, of the sites. Um, and also the issue that the sites were not finding common solutions to the common problems. We're very good at finding the common problems between us all, but now we should start thinking about how to find common solutions. Um, so I'm going to go on to the big piece of paper where we were talking about the vision. Um, we felt that definitely we wanted a, a sort of a label world where European isn't restricted to the members of the European Union. Um, and in fact, what did pop up under threats was that possibly the current decision, the current legal basis might be one of the threats because it is a constraining factor geographically and also within the mechanics of the scheme, which everybody from different corners has found sort of a bit frustrating. Um, excuse me, while I struggle with the pages. Um, it was felt that in five years' time, we want to sort of grow the whole European consciousness of the, of the label, um, that it is a, a commonwealth, really, of, of, of um, our heritage, um, and that it should transcend borders and politics, and um, that it could provide a constant in this. Um, and also, we talked about the Faro Convention approach about people, um, that there is enormous... Um, potential and in the future for having far greater connections to people everywhere, our localities, um, particular, you know, the education side, but also people elsewhere within Europe and beyond, um, that we want a scheme where there is, you know, fantastically resourced communications, um, but that importantly we have better financial resources um, for enabling the production of materials, but also for staff. What is very important is that the sites need, in order to realize the potential of the label, sites need people to do that. They're the m most effective site. Um, and the, it was felt we need a dynamic network, sort of with a constant dialogue going on about our shared common values. So this idea that really, European heritage is about ideas as much as it is about sites and places uh, and um, also our common values, our common identity around diversity, solidarity, um, our curiosity, inclusion um, and a, a sort of a network of sites within which people sort of anywhere within Europe can feel validated by it. They see themselves in it, that it is inclusive. Um, and I think that's probably... Um, I think that's, those are the main points, just scanning on that. And sorry, just one point, that we need to make sure that it works um, while we have the slogan for the European year, where the past meets the future, we need to make sure that the label scheme turns that into a reality, that we're bringing in our young people and that we're actually um, using it as a sort of place to, to create new ideas and inspirations for our future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, open and broadening the thinking about European Union, uh, links and networking, European dimension, young people, but also threats like lack of recognition and lack of leadership. So, uh, thank you so much. Could I add one, sorry, point came up at the end, which is the need that the label sites would keep, would underline um, the, the need for a, a strong historical consciousness um, around our sort of multiple identities that we need to keep, you know, we need to support in a way the study and teaching of history and that the label sites are an ideal sort of classroom place. So. Studying and teaching of history. So, oh yeah, history education. Yes. Thank you for this observation. Uh, we also observe that the uh, meaning of history lesson is somehow diminishing and I guess it's one of the European problems. Uh, maybe not the most important one, but uh, very important. And now I would like to pass the voice to Gabor Shonkoli. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we actually had a very fruitful uh, discussion down in the cellar. Actually, there were uh, 11 persons involved from seven countries, so the coverage was very impressive. 
And actually what we came up with is very complementary what just uh, your group uh, had as a uh, result of the discussion. Uh, the questions we received were about three topics, preparation of the uh, proposal, uh, the impact of the EHL and uh, also the, the, the importance of the network. And we tried to, in, especially in discussing the impact and the network, we, we also tried to use a SWOT analysis, see the strengths and the weaknesses. And at the end, we had a discussion about the wishes, how uh, the vision could be, could be seen in the near future. So these are the three units, so preparation, uh, the SWOT of the actual site, and the wishes. And in the preparation process, uh, it was uh, concluded that uh, it is very difficult for the sites themselves to define European significance. It seems to be very theoretical and doesn't really have uh, a concrete uh, content for, for many, uh, even for the winning sites or the selected sites, so there was this demand that it should be articulated more clearly for a future candidature. The second was about the project. It was mentioned that uh, when a proposal is, uh, is prepared, um, those who are preparing it uh, should be aware of the fact that they have to have a vision about the future of their own site. It's just not enough to represent it and describe it, but they should also put it to a, a longer, longer run uh, in the future. One of the greatest challenges in the preparation of an EHL uh, site is the switch from the national narrative to the European na narrative and to think about other European countries or other European uh, 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 actors, how they would interpret that site, which is maybe so obvious from the point of view of, of the importance of uh, in a national narrative. So that, uh, and that, that needs some education, that needs some assistance, and the problem of assistance was raised uh, from the perspective of new sites. Uh, it was mentioned several times that uh, um, those who, uh, especially in those countries which are lacking at the moment EHL sites, it's very difficult to, cal to help assistance to prepare uh, um, a, um, a proposal. And in a particular case, we had one participant from Ukraine, as, as similarly what you just said, there was this demand to, to go beyond the, 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 the borders of the European Union and allow other countries also to, to, to propose sites uh, for, for European heritage label. From the perspective of the impact and the, and the network, one of the main challenges were identified as the role of the European heritage sites to mediate between the citizens, European citizens, and the values. And it's not just because the values are not clearly articulated, it's also uh, there are different skills are uh, demanded to draw the attention of the citizens. So very often at the moment, uh, you, I mean, those uh, heritage sites who were present uh, uh, identified this problem as, as one of the main challenges, how to bring citizens and European values together through their own existence. The, the other one is the, uh, the lack of coordination between the myriads of EU initiatives about culture. Uh, it was mentioned several times that there are so many initiatives uh, and uh, out of them European uh, heritage label is only one and even from the bureaucratic point of view it's very uh, it's a real challenge to put these initiatives together not mentioning the citizens uh, so it's not just the problem of visibility of EHL but it's also a problem of visibility of the other uh, other initiatives, how to bring, bring them together, and of course, they are all excellent uh, uh, cultural capitals for the European Union, but it would be, their impact could be doubled or multiplied if they would be represented together, and if their use and character would be represented together, including, of course, the EHL. And the other main challenge uh, of the already existing HL sites was the role of the national level in the assistance of the maintenance of the sites. 
because already uh, it was mentioned that the site itself has problems, can have problems with the national representatives who are not always their structure or their role is not necessarily in harmony with, uh, with, uh, with the European level. So there, there can be bureaucratic uh, difficulties. Uh, they are, the, the, the two structures, the national and the European, are not necessarily identical. So the, the representatives of the EHL uh, side have difficulties to find always the, the proper interlocutor when they need assistance or when they need news about, uh, about the network. So these were the three main uh, questions raised, and then we uh, ended up with the wishes, so the vision. And there were also three main areas which were uh, uh, articulated. The first one, of course, similarly to the group uh, of uh, Beatrice, the problem of promotion. So there is a very harsh need to, to, for the EHL the promotion uh, in many instances, in many levels. National representatives in Brussels and the EU uh, um, instances should know more about their own EHL sites and they should, they should be more aware of, of their existence. Uh, it is also important that uh, Creative Europe offices in the uh, in national capitals uh, would be more active, uh, benefiting from the presence of each EHL sites in the given countries. Ministries of Foreign Affairs and other ministries in, in involved should be more uh, aware of, of the importance of these sites. And of course, there are other, many other networks uh, um, academic, scholarly, uh, or uh, heritage-based networks also, uh, uh, to which these sites also belong to. So it's, it can be also used in a better way, more efficient way, uh, for the EHL sites to bring together these different networks. Uh, and of course, uh, within the EHL network itself, there should be a better communication. The other big wish was about young people. Uh, of course, there's the education. Uh, uh, of course, there's already existing uh, uh, historical consciousness in Europe, in schools, at universities, at, at academic institutions. They should be much more aware of the EHL side. And uh, um, the young people should be represented and involved in a more active and co-creative way. So any time when these sites come together, it shouldn't be only the, the professional representatives who tell their story, but it would be maybe uh, a good advice to bring young people to these meetings to, to share their interpretation, their experience about the sites. And of course, uh, again, the visibility in the social media for the EHL sites would be really, really important in a much more efficient way than it is right now. And the third one is very much related uh, to, 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 uh, to the vision problem. It's uh, the demand for a sustainable strategy, uh, a long run, long term strategy uh, for the EHL. On one level, the maintenance of the already existing uh, site, so that was uttered as a qualitative strategy for the EHL. And the other one is the, the vision for the expansion uh, of the site, so, but it is only doable if the already existing site is, uh, is well articulated and, uh, and uh, receives the necessary uh, visibility what it deserves at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So we need European significance, and some kind of educational assistance. We should go beyond European borders. We need long-term strategy, better communication, and it will help us to bring a notion of European citizenship. Thank you so much for these observations. Uh, I hope we'll come to uh, these observations again during the final discussion. And uh, last but not least, I would like to ask Marek to bring us his observation about the third group discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I must say that uh, the results of, of the workshop of the third group 
uh, are maybe slightly different uh, than yours. I would say that we did not really have uh, so much coherence between uh, different voices. Uh, the workshop was very fruitful, but uh, we definitely had varying pers perspectives from, from different sides. Of course, only uh, you know, when it came to some, some of the issues on others, we had uh, total agreement among uh, the participants. And we also touched maybe uh, a little more the procedural aspects of the EHL. So starting with those, um, one, one of the uh, aspects I asked about is uh, whether uh, the designation, uh, did it come from the site itself or whether it was a governmental uh, idea and uh, in vast ma well, when it came to vast majority of the sites, uh, it was their autonomous idea. Sometimes, of course, it was a suggestion from, uh, from the national coordinator, especially. But, uh, yeah, vast, vast majority decided upon that uh, themselves. And uh, maybe to answer a question which was raised yesterday um, about uh, the designation of the sites to be uh, named or to be branded as EHL sites, a question which was asked about Mr. Manier, whether the two-step uh, verification of proposals is the right one or not. Uh, I guess that uh, according to the results of, of our group, it's definitely the good, uh, the good choice, because uh, as we heard uh, during the workshop uh, in Poland, there were 21 proposals for the inscription and you know uh, should uh, uh, should the ministry not select any of them all of the applications would be sent uh, to the experts panel so unless you'd like to drown <laughs> with fork uh, our our group would suggest to keep uh, this two-step um, way of verif uh, verification of, of sites and also when it came to uh, just the procedure of uh, verifying uh, the sites, one of the aspects on which we did not have uh, agreement among participants was whether it would be beneficial to have uh, members of the expert panel visiting the sites during the process of uh, verification. And uh, in here, just let me say that uh, the sites uh, which took part, which were represented uh, in the uh, group number three, varied to a great extent. And I can say that uh, the bigger the site is, uh, the more they would appreciate the visit from uh, on the uh, expert panel. But when it came to sites who represent, uh, who, who hold the title because of a document, they hold uh, in their collection. Uh, for them, it doesn't, uh, it's not really that necessary uh, to have someone visit them. And I believe that uh, it's just a thing that would vary to a great extent uh, between different types of sites. And as you all know, the definition of a site uh, in, the, uh, in the forms and, and uh, the definition is very, very broad. So. Uh, it must be taken into account that this is the reason for uh, different different opinions. And also when it comes to uh, just the procedure of uh, inscribing one of the sites to the list of EHL sites, uh, we know that, that the members of the workshop uh, know that uh, the requirements and the forms uh, they need to fill in have changed but they are still not clear enough. And uh, there are some sites that uh, give up trying to become an EHL site because of uh, the bureaucratic reasons, uh, because the forms are not clear enough, uh, even though they were, uh, they were already shortened, but there is still uh, some improvement to be done in that very field. Also, uh, when it came to uh, a procedure, uh, but already uh, already regarding a site which is an EHL site. A question which was raised is whether uh, such site can be modified. 
uh, because sometimes during uh, the process of inscription, it might, uh, the diagnosis for, for example, which fragments of a city uh, are to be inscribed, the diagnosis might not be uh, perfect, and uh, there was such, such issue raised by one of the sites that there should be a procedure for uh, the possibility of uh, modifying the site a little once it's already uh, an EHL site. So, yes. um, and also, uh, it would be very, uh, very necessary to introduce some kind of guidelines for the sites during the process, uh, for the process of inscription. And uh, this is a thing that both of you mentioned, that uh, it's very hard to identify what's the European narrative and uh, you know, which, which aspects are to be highlighted. So definitely a guideline for the sites which uh, are applying to, to be an EHL site would be very, very beneficial. Uh, when it comes to the situation of, of the sites already got the title. Uh, we heard about uh, very, uh, very good examples of networking among some of the sites uh, in our group. Um, but of course, there are some needs, and uh, I guess that I'd be, I will be doubling what you already said. Uh, but maybe just to touch some other aspects, uh, it was drawn. Uh, that uh, the website of EHL uh, program is not sufficient. And in fact, recently it's not even working. Uh, so uh, this is a thing which is very important for the sites. And maybe you know, using uh, the so-called subsidiary uh, aspect of European Union, some of the sites said that it would be good if uh, the European Commission would create a space for them on the website so that they could fill it in themselves uh, and you know just put it uh, make it maybe a more a bit more individual a bit more uh, from their own perspective but still within the whole European uh, narrative uh, of course uh, and I simply don't want to uh, say things that you've already said, because uh, you know things like the visibility, uh, the resources. Of course, that was uh, also mentioned in our group. But uh, I think that there were two uh, two opinions very very valuable when it came to visibility. One of them would be the fact that uh, it's hard to achieve visibility among Europeans, among among people if the EHL seems to be a bit invisible for the European Commission. Uh, that, uh, you know, the, the European Commission doesn't seem to be paying that much attention. Of course, there, uh, there are officials responsible for the project, uh, but we could hear yesterday during, um, you know, during the panel discussion, during the lectures, uh, that it's not really mentioned that often uh, by the high officials. So, yeah, it was, uh, this was mentioned, and also uh, by one of, of the sites which has a very large number of visitors each year. Uh, I found it quite interesting to, to hear that it's the site that promotes the European Heritage Label program, because they are an EHL site, and, you know, uh, they have more recognition than the program itself, so it's more the program promoting uh, the, the, the site promoting the program than the other way so far, but of course it's a thing which which is developing. Um, yeah, and um, there were also uh, split opinions uh, about the networking program which was offered. Uh, some of the sites found it uh, found it very. Uh, very good. Some some had some reservations about it. Uh, however, maybe one disadvantage of, of the uh, offer, which was uh, mentioned, was that the sites would have to compete among each other for uh, for uh, uh, to be the beneficiary of the program. And maybe it's a suggestions to the sites themselves that they should unite and maybe all uh, 30 well 
I don't know if 38, but that would be the best situation. Maybe they would all join, uh, join and uh, you know, offer one uh, application for, for their program, because otherwise they would have to compete between themselves, and that's not really what the EHO is supposed to be about. Uh, and I guess that those would be uh, the results of our workshop. As I say, there were plenty more, but it's what you've already said, so uh, I, I simply don't want to uh, copy you now. Thank you. Hmm. Lack of communication, lack of the frames for networking, and lack of guidelines for the uh, future uh, EHLs. It looks that you are the real winners going through such a tough and complicated procedures. Congratulations. And uh, I guess we still have a very short brief time for the answers and questions for our reporters. Are there any questions? Uh, if not, I would like to thank you. Dear colleagues, it is time for the final discussion and uh, for this, let's say, resume session, I would like to invite at first uh, Beatrice Kelly. I would also like to invite uh, <clears throat> Miss Benedict Selzlak. Uh, moreover, I would like to invite Professor Jacek Purchla and Professor Gabor Shonkoli. So please take the seat and let us have this opportunity to discuss the future of EHL. Just before the coffee break, uh, we had this chance to hear the <coughs> voice from the side of the uh, European Heritage Label sites. Uh, we heard about uh, the problems, about the opportunities, with, about the strength uh, elements of this project, but also about the problems. And uh, this last uh, hour, uh, let us use for the discussion about the future of the um, uh, project. Uh, I would uh, highly appreciate if uh, I could ask each of you to uh, give us uh, some remarks dedicated to, at first, the result of this very meeting. A few times in these last two days we could hear that uh, it was one of the very first moments when so many uh, sites representatives could meet and discuss the common issues. Uh, but uh, also uh, let us discuss the question about the future of the project. And uh, mm, as a first one, I would like to ask um, Gabor Shonkoli to uh, present his observation. I'd like to thank all the representatives of the EHL sites who came here. Uh, it's most impressive that even that uh, um, we heard during this one and a half days how little assistance and help they received from the European uh, Commission. Uh, they, they are still here and they are still the cust custodians of, uh, of European identity. I was really much impressed by that. I was really much impressed this morning by the, the five uh, sites uh, as well. And uh, of course, uh, I think it's very important that the ICC organize this, this meeting. Uh, it is an excellent idea and it should be repeated yearly or at least regularly. And um, maybe just to, to give a, uh, some, to share you my thoughts as a new member of the panel since I was ele uh, selected uh, last year. 
I'd like to draw the attention of all the participants to the report of the panel, which was published uh, December 2017, which is a very well written uh, vision, I suppose, uh, for 2030. And uh, I think this report really much reflects basically all the problems we were discussing or we have been discussing uh, so far during this conference. And this report uh, talks about the achievements which should be attained uh, by the EHL, the objectives and the roadmap. And the first one about the achievements is um, hopefully there would be a new perceptions of the narratives of European significance. And since in the previous session uh, this uh, lack of cl uh, clarity of the European significance was uh, tackled, but I don't think that it's so easy to give a clear definition of European significance. Why? Because that would be uh, understood by scholars and historians that the European Union is imposing its narrative to the sites. So I think that's a very important learning process that uh, it was uh, Olga Tovasovska, who, who said uh, yesterday that we should somehow merge the bottom up and the top down. And I think we should also merge it uh, while we talk about European significance. If the European significance is defined uh, point by point by the European Heritage Label Panel, uh, that would be really considered as a meta-narrative imposed on European citizens. So that's why I think it, there's also liberty in this on so-called or maybe defined as unclear definition of the European significance. The uh, European significance, significance should be co-creative, should be uh, understood, I suppose, from, from the citizens as well, not just from you know, a deep body, administrative, bureaucratic, or even academic body in Brussels. The second achievements which should be uh, attained is a dynamic network and uh, to, to give emotional and intellectual heritage experience. And that's also a word which was uttered many times. I think it's very important that at the moment um, we have a very much established and a long existing network of higher education, schools, and uh, academic institutions which really uh, focus on, on the intellectual interpretation of the past, but we don't have so much about the emotional. And at the same time, we are living a very emotional, sensational period. And uh, I think heritage sites can be uh, a solution for this in a way to give both a critical approach to the past at the same time offer uh, an experience which includes the emotional experience as well. And also in the report, uh, uh, the, the, the panel talks about that the, the, should, the, the panel, I mean the, the EHL should be definitely extended beyond the current borders of the European Union. Um, there's also, uh, I think, very clear uh, ideas of the object objectives and the roadmap. I don't want to repeat them because that would take uh, uh, a larger amount of time. I'd just like to refer to what we heard about uh, Michel Magny uh, yesterday because he mentioned two things. There would be more money and more promotion, which is very good, but I think we should, we should go further. Uh, the European Heritage Label is underway its institutionalization. It's still a child, it's, um, okay, it depends where we start its age, but okay, let's say 2011. So it's, uh, it just entered school in most of the European countries. Uh, but the institutionalization, I think, hasn't reached its level of a seven-year-old boy or girl. Uh, so there should be really more reflection of those who created the European Heritage Label, how this institutionalization can be developed further. Um, it's a panel and uh, one or two administrators, clearly not enough to handle the current problem. Uh, the 38 sites are really respectable the most that today do this, uh, but there is an obvious uh, demand uh, to, to expand this, this uh, 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 initiative. 
Uh, and I think one of the, the most logical step forward would be the integration of uh, academics, uh, higher education, uh, schools, etc., because they basically do the same thing from a different approach. But historians don't really understand or see the necessity to work with heritage very often. So I think there is this sensibilization of academics towards not just EHL per se, but heritage. So history and heritage should be brought together. Otherwise, there will be a serious problem of European uh, uh, in identity building, I would say. Why? Because, uh, of course, there are, uh, we live in a, it was also said yesterday, we live in a period of uncertainties. It's very difficult to find anything uh, theoretically, ideologically sta uh, static or, or, or certain at this, at this moment. And uh, one of the main enemies of culture building is populism, if Europe is all over. So if Europe doesn't take its culture building, identity building seriously, somebody else will do that, or already doing it. So there are other uh, options. Uh, very much anti, which are very far from the, the, the European significance and values, what we all share here, I would say. So, um, the EHL uh, can be an excellent example that culture shouldn't be an object of war, a Kulturkampf, led by populists, but it's a long uh, process of appropriation and uh, appropriation by the administrative or bureaucratic uh, organizations, the civil society, but also the professionals. So I think we should enlarge the, 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 the stakeholders of the European Heritage Label. It's very often happening. I just experienced it during the session that we had this afternoon. Of course, very often historians of arts, historians, museologists, and other professionals are involved in running and maintaining the sites. But it, this, this uh, group should be more, much, uh, more involved in that. Um, in the morning, uh, uh, sorry, yesterday in the morning we had uh, Dr. Kakulevsky's uh, lecture about a critical perspective, the EHL from a critical perspective. And uh, we could also see there how much a historian and a heritage expert see the same problem. And I would say that EHL can be a solution for his hermeneutical problem that he talked about, about heritage, uh, since EHL is creating now its own history. But uh, we, we are in a necessity for uh, places of memory, or we are of memory, as he said, because in this uh, conflict with, with populism and the populist interpretation of identity uh, at the moment in Europe, we are in a necessity of positive messages, uh, a solution for uncertainty. To, um, and we shouldn't forget that we live in a, in a leisure society. People want to have fun. There is a very strong commodification. Uh, uh, that is not a problem. I mean, we, we, we have to live with that. And of course, there's also digital society. All the things which are promoted and very often uh, are subsidized or by, the, by different European initiatives, but these all should be put together uh, in a way, in these heritage sites with critical approach to the past. And these things, but for that, and it was also said in, the, in, the, in our uh, uh, session uh, before the coffee break, these should be brought together, and these many myriads of networks really should be brought together, including uh, uh, universities. Uh, because one, one important point is, I suppose, that the populists very often don't have a culture. They have an, a political agenda, how to take over cultural institutions, but one, it's, once it's happened, they don't really know what to do with it from the, from the point of view of current demand of the population, especially of young people. Uh, so that's why uh, the European Heritage Label sites, and that's what we could witness in this one and a half days, can be a real solution of um, a shared uh, experience of the past. Um, because if we go on this direction of populism, for, uh, from that point of view, the national is a revival and it's very rigid. If we use the Leo Strauss 
Levi-Strauss interpretation, uh, it's a vision of Europe of a cold society, which is alien to uh, dynamic, and this is totally uh, uh, anachronistic in, our, uh, in the global age, what we are experiencing right now. So the European discourse should be very much a hot discourse, a dynamic discourse, the, the interpretation of, of our past sites and places of memory as dynamic, because they always have been uh, dynamic. Uh, it can be the Roman period or the 19th century in, in history. So we could offer, or this EHSIs could offer a, a hot uh, and a dynamic, uh, a hot image uh, of, of culture. And the last uh, idea I'd like to uh, speak about is, it was uh, mentioned several times yesterday by Benedict Selsley and also uh, uh, Professor Kolowski that uh, uh, we, we have to construct a landscape of European cultural heritage. But what is a landscape? I, the, as a historian, I can't help drawing your attention to the fact that landscape appeared as a fashion word uh, or term three times in history. First it was in the Renaissance, as we all know that. The second is the Romanticism of the nation building of the 19th century. And now the third one is the current period. So any time landscape appears, it always shows something for us. And what is common in the three periods that uh, there's always a recognition of an elite there's something, uh, something happened, a, rap a rapture took place, which can't be, so something behind that can't be brought back. It can be the Middle Ages, it can be the Enlightenment or the 18th century or the, old, the Ancien Regime, or it can be the modernization of the 20th century. So there's always a recognition of a rupture, but at the same time, there's always a nostalgia for the past, as in the Renaissance, as in the Romanticism, or as in the uh, ultra, ultra conservative movements right now. So, but landscape also a possibility because it brings the natural and the cultural together, and uh, uh, it offers a possibility right now in an age which is so much burdened by uncertainty, a kind of possibility for reenchantment of the world. I think that's a key term because if Europe keeps, uh, or European organizations or the European Union keeps its image as a bureaucratic and economic organization solely, it won't really offer it, uh, a possibility for its citizens to get attached to it. And I think it's very important to create initiatives like the European Heritage Label uh, to give a possibility of a kind of personalization, the personification of Europe uh, as, as, a, as a cultural entity, as a cultural identity. So, and these EHL size together can really construct the landscape. So the possi possibility is it's there, it's, it's around us, uh, we should really use it, otherwise there's a real uh, the threat that we will be only aware of the, of the fact or the European citizens that the period is over, the period of, uh, of the 20th century when ideologies were still or seem to be uh, um, reliable is over and, uh, uh, and that uh, only nostalgia would take over. So I think it's very important to, to have this positive message, to have this uh, uh, possibility in hand and create this landscape of positive messages and this uh, re-enchantment which, which will take place anyway in the hands, in our hands. Otherwise, uh, we would really miss a very, very important opportunity. So that was my uh, uh, impression. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So many ideas and a strong voice from Central Europe. Thanks again. And now I would like to pass the voice to um, Benedict uh, Selfslag, uh, asking about your, uh, let's say, ideas about this very meeting and about the future of European Heritage Label. Allow me to start by thanking uh, Professor Pushna, um, dear Jacek and the ICC for, this, for um, organizing this meeting. It came so timely. And uh, I would like to extend my thanks also to you participants. It's always a pleasure to listen to your contributions. 
we learn so much uh, from you, from each other. This morning, uh, listening to the sites, it uh, reminded me of the 2016 monitoring exercise. And what was wonderful to see is um, the progress that many sites have made in implementing the project, but also in their thinking about the site, uh, their own site, and about their mission statement. Um, we have here um, a positive impetus that I felt in, in the meeting. I hope you felt it as well. There are many fresh ideas. There are also quite a lot of ideas that pop up all the time, all over again. So it must be that they are very, very good. And uh, I want to draw your attention, like um, Garber just um, did, to the 10 recommendations that the panel made in its last report. Um, and if I take a few of them, it's that the European Heritage uh, Label Network receive funding or that candidate sites receive support for, their, uh, for the preparation of their uh, applications, that the website of the uh, European Heritage Label and, and the Commission is more user-friendly and more active. Uh, I will not continue because actually it coincides with many, many of, of your ideas, actually the whole list. Now, some of those ideas are very easy and can be implemented, in fact, right away, and we all have a responsibility, each at our own level. So let's just do it. Let's go, go away from Krakow with, with this, uh, with this um, um, let's say, with this positive um, energy. Other ideas will take a little bit more time, as you may have understood. Um, but I think we need to be ambitious and realistic at the same time. And I would like to remind that, in fact, the European Heritage Label uh, has many stakeholders. Um, the panel is just one of them, but we have been trying to be very supportive of all the other stakeholders. I would like to mention the national coordinators very uh, specifically because they have a crucial role. I would like to thank them for their support and for the support to come and for the new national coordinators to come. Welcome in the family. Um, I would like to talk also about the commission. Uh, I've heard some recommendations to the commission that are actually the same recommendations as the panel uh, made to the sites. And so about, um, about the website, about communication, and so on, about um, awareness of the staff. So, yeah, let's try to work together with it. And last but not least, we have the sites. But because what would be the European Heritage Label without you? You are making the European Heritage Label. And so we need you, and we need to net the network as well. I heard some questions about the network, and it's not really clear how everything works out. I'm very sure that we will find solutions, and we have uh, Gloria, who is here and, and who um, uh, met you, and she is very eager to support you, like Gerald did. And I would like publicly to thank Gerald for his work, and we um, passed around the card. Thank you for those who, who signed it. I hope, Gloria, that you can transmit our thanks to him. And then, um, uh, maybe uh, I'm thinking also of the sites and the national co coordinators who could not make it. There were a few sites that um, could not participate at the last minute. I see there a real role for maybe the ICC together with the Commission to reach out between now and, and, and the coming months to explain what the ideas will be for the near future and especially for this call and to make sure that the information that we had here is shared with the other members of the family. Um, Gabor and others mentioned or compared the European Heritage Label with a child. It's not uh, a baby anymore. It's not even a toddler anymore. It's becoming a child. 
Um, there are high expectations. Sometimes I'm thinking, but you don't ask a child to participate in the Olympic Games. Um, maybe that's the ambitious ambition that we should have, but let's be realistic and do everything step by step. And I'm absolutely delighted that I could be here with you. I would have loved to stay a little bit longer, um, but unfortunately I will have to, to catch a plane. So I count on my colleagues and you and my dear friend Jacek to keep me informed of the end of the conference. And good luck with everything. Um, I look forward uh, uh, from hearing from the sites and this network of the European Heritage Legal Sites. Congratulations to everybody. You have a great job. Thank you, Benedict. Thank you very much for everything. But do stay with us another 15 minutes. Your taxi is scheduled 10 minutes to five. Take your time. With Pleasure. Enjoy <laughs> this very meeting. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now I would like to ask the same questions about the outcomes of this meeting and about the future of the European Heritage Label to uh, Chila Hegedus. If you could share your opinion and um, observations. Well, I must start with uh, thanking uh, um, the ICC, the organizers, as well as to the sites this for the, the pleasure of being together in the last two days. Um, for me, it's for the first time when I see the sites face to face, and uh, it was an incredible idea to have enough time to let the sites explain what they are doing and share with us their challenges. I think that I cannot compliment enough uh, uh, Jacek and his team for, for this idea because we needed the time, we needed the, the time for the presentation, we need the time for the discussions. Um, because without your feedback, without your work, first of all, but without your feedback, and, uh, the jury uh, cannot work. And I'm sure that also for the commission, it was an absolutely invaluable time to, to be able to hear uh, your thoughts and criticisms. And thank you for that. Um, this, this jury has been never afraid of, of criticism and, uh, and, and we absolutely welcome it, so uh, please carry on telling us off and, and telling us what we don't do properly. Um, the, the best way, I think, to present what we think about Europe is the European Heritage Label. Um, it is, as I said, the, the broadest way of explaining what and how Europe was built. Whether we are talking about building it through the history or whether we are talking about the, the building of the European Union. So if I would be the Commission or I would be the European Parliament, I would put all my money into this tool because the European citizens are listening much more to you, to the sites, and to the people, your words, your colleagues' words, than to the President of the European Parliament or to anybody else, or to any politician. Trust me, I am a politician and I know what I'm talking about. So, the, for me it was incredibly interesting when you were asked, why have you applied? to the European Heritage Label. The fact that there were five sites sitting here and telling us in, their, in your language the most beautiful message of Europe, that was something that was worth traveling 10 hours for. And if there, and going back another 10 hours. So if, if I believe in something, it is your, the site's creative force. And I know that that creative force will take us through any problems, any bad decisions, or any other issues. Oh. There is one more problem that I would like to, to, to talk about, and that is um, the network, and that is the use. I totally agree with what uh, Agatha was saying, that the network and all our work should include more of the academia, more the universities, more the schools, because that uh, 
how should I say, that organization, if you wish, so the science, the academia, the schools, will make the European heritage label to get to absolutely everybody in Europe. And with your help and with this uh, uh, work together, we will get the European message to where it needs to be. And I'm sure that this will be a very, very healthy foundation to build the next 100 years of the European Union together. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I would like to pass the voice to uh, Beatrice Kelly. Uh, you were one of the moderators of the workshop. So could you tell us uh, not about the site's perspective, but your perspective? Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the ICC again for inviting me. It's been an, a great privilege, particularly because of getting a real sort of tangible sense of the passion and energy from you, you, the sites, and the national coordinators. And I think that is what has struck me really over the past two days, um, particularly you know, with the workshops and things, is that you are the motor of this. And while we don't necessarily know where we're all going with it, and as Gabo has explained, you know, there is so much uncertainty, um, I think you should be the drivers, um, and I think you should you know, feel empowered to, to drive, as it were, and we have the news, obviously, about the call for the, the network, and that that is an enabler, but I think the driver, you know, I think you should be, and you're so capable, um, and you have such credibility, really, to take charge. So, in the heritage world, we spend so much time talking about, oh yes, bottom-up, people-centered approaches. Let's turn that into this, because I think it was expressed very clearly in the workshops, really that the value of this scheme is not just the, the material heritage, but it's very much this sort of world of ideas, these shared ideas and values and curiosity um, that, that, that we have. Um, it's making me absolutely want to go back to the ministry um, who I sort of work to and say, Ireland must join, you know, we have to be part of this as well. And so I think, this, you know, it's been, two quite long days and it's also we have another day tomorrow but I think there is a real sense of um, sort of excitement and energy and potential massive potential there are difficulties I'm not saying it's going to be easy at all but I do think um, you know that there is a real passion um, particularly among the sites um, that, that um, we, we, we should make the most of this thank you very much And uh, I also would like to ask the same question, Professor Jacek Purkla. Don't be afraid, I will be very short. But firstly, I understand that it's really a dress in the name of Agatha, present here, and myself, our solemn gratitude to the survivors of this marathon. <laughs> uh, this is the proof that uh, European Heritage Label has its future. You are the future. Uh, but we are not at the political rally. We are at the conference room of a serious institution which likes to act as a bridge but also as a catalyst. So if this very meeting could be considered also as an important step towards the future, I'm the last who is going to complain. Uh, presumably, it is why I would love to be very short, it is also the last moment to open the floor. Uh, dialogue is essential, I understand that what is, to me, a real added value of this meeting is this very opportunity to improve our own communication. We just proved that the real potential is today on the side of the 38 sites. So I'm not going to repeat what has been said already even several times, but heritage is the people. And as we, the survivors of this marathon, are here as the core, I mean, the site managers, but also panel members, national coordinators, 
the Gloria, our great hope and future, and ICC as catalyst, uh, preparing, of course, as a final product. I understand that Agatha will uh, emphasize that at uh, last, let's say, words of this very conference, uh, that the next uh, issue of our quarterly Herito will be very much dedicated mm. to the problem, which I hope will help also help Gloria and help Michel uh, to execute those new ideas which have been already and publicly declared here. I mean, new approach from the side of the Commission and the idea of the network, which is, which is really great and it is also our experience of the International Cultural Center. We do not believe in this saying that networking is not working. <laughs> networking works and helps and sometimes creates this synergy which is dramatically needed. And just to finish, uh, just me say that complaining we used to emphasize several times, asking ourselves why uh, UNESCO World Heritage List is such a strong brand, a success story, and so on, and we poor, and so on. Uh, it will come. Uh, but paradoxically, there is one clear parallel, and it is my conclusion, between UNESCO World Heritage List and the dilemmas of the Convention at the moment, and the problem of European heritage label. It is just the proof that the success story of both projects, both wonderful and complementary projects, is on the side of the people. So it is the most beautiful conclusion. We, the people. Yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you so much. Actually, I have still many questions, but maybe for the next meeting of the <laughs> European Heritage Labels, questions dedicated to actually how to operate, what kind of tools and guidelines uh, we can propose for the future, but I guess it is a time for the questions from your side, your observations after these two very intensive days. Uh, so, um, I guess we'll be very happy if you could share with us right now uh, your observations. Uh, I would like to know something more about a very interesting topic, which was mentioned in this uh, discussion before lunch. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know who the Mr. was who mentioned this, this topic. He was a program about uh, a program who is promoting uniting of all cities in Europe, which were founded by the ancient Romans in the, th in the, in the time of, of, of Rome of the Imperium of Rome, it's extremely interesting as, uh, as, as, as just as a material um, a common European heritage. And I mean also, we, so I mean we, can, we, we, we have to, 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 to it, it, it must be really done and really promote, promote it. And I also think that it's also at the okay, a, a very good occasion to underline that after the big, the huge, the fantastic, phenomenal culture of Rome and uh, its impact on the common uh, European mentality came the Christianis Christianism, which was wider, which, was, which brought the spiritual values, values who was like, um, um, how to say, Mm, yes, just and the the addition, the uh, 
they, need, they needed addition to the material culture which was founded in the time of ancient Rome. Thank you. Thank you so much. European Heritage Label is about the layers. The conclusion is these are our really, really European roots. We have to be proud of it. So I, like, I would like uh, to know something more about the program. I'm not sure who was uh, initiated this very idea and who presented this very idea. Uh, I hope that will come uh, during the discussion, maybe. Uh, I'm afraid that the person who was presenting this issue is not with us any longer, I'm sorry to say so. Uh, but European Heritage Label is about the layers of the past and uh, the Romans, Christianity, but also the Enlightenment, uh, also the 20th century, as we heard yesterday and today, uh, should be included. Are there any other observations or questions concerning this very meeting? Thank you very much. Uh, for us, for Spanish experts, uh, this conference uh, has been so interesting, and I think that the we are open the eyes for many uh, maybe problems or not problems because this is a new category, and uh, we need more time for consolidate and for uh, promoting better all kind of things. And then is uh, we need this kind of meetings uh, for debating, for discuss, and for listening other kind of alternatives, perspective, and, and things. Uh, in general, uh, we give you thanks for inviting us uh, to, to, to be here and to have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other voice? Uh, if not, um, actually I would like to uh, use this opportunity that we still have uh, a few more minutes and ask the experts who are with us about the uh, proper tools that we should use in the future. Uh, we already um, are again, I, 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 I think, um, can agree that uh, mm, there are some obstacles uh, at the front of this uh, project. And I guess that we agree that uh, we can uh, somehow uh, confront them. But um, if uh, using these few more minutes uh, you could uh, present at least one uh, useful solution for the short term and maybe for the longer term. I'd be uh, very happy to um, listen to your proposals. Gabor? Well, very briefly, just a reflection on your remark. Just imagine that in the UNESCO day, the convention was signed in 72 and they started the list in 78. So if you count in European terms, you know, there shouldn't be any sites yet because it was uh, signed in 11. So we already with 38. So from that sense, we are doing better than the UNESCO in the 1970s. That's just a joke. Concerning the, the tools, uh, I think funding is uh, essential. Uh, as the sites need, need more funding. And I think dedicated to the European Heritage Label. Uh, I think all the dedication that different sites already showed should be recognized and rewarded by the European Union. Uh, I know it's not funding, doesn't solve anything, but you need money for run. So I, I would say that somebody should reflect how the institutionalization of the European heritage label should go on. So that's, I think, the first thing. And there's a huge literature on institutionalization. The European Union has been excellent in institutionalizing wonderful things. I think they should be applied to the European Heritage Label. This is one of the main custodian of, uh, of uh, community, um, culture building and even community building in, in the EU. So that's, that's what be the first one. And the second one was also raised, I don't want to repeat it, but promotion. Promotion of the European Heritage Label as such, as a network, 
uh, uh, and uh, also, as it was also mentioned, using already existing networks in the relationship to the European Heritage Label, especially from the point of view of education and young people and academia. Thank you so much. Patrice? Um, to that list, I would add training and mentoring, um, so that training for, you know, between sites, as it were, but also maybe mentoring from existing sites to potential sites, you know, be they either thematic or geographic proximity. Um, and then also, I think for the national coordinators, you know, if, if national coordinators want to sort of, um, you know, either mentor sites or, or be mentored by other um, national coordinators maybe who have made successful applications as well. I think that that can be extremely valuable tools. Thank you. Well, um, I just heard that uh, we have a, a fairly new national coordinator in Italy and she has actually organized a meeting uh, inviting the right people and she had uh, well over 100 uh, participants to that meeting who all want to apply to the European Heritage Label from Italy. So that will allow for, for 50 years, isn't it? Am I counting properly? <laughs> uh, with two sites per, per, per year to, so Italy sorted for, for Gloria, that's all right. Um, just uh, two things because my colleagues have told you everything. First of all, I think that the most important tool is, well, is, is in the hands of the national coordinators and they need help and support to be able to help the sites to, to prepare very, very good applications. Um, that's one thing. And the second thing is the, the network which can offer the necessarily at education, training, and awareness raising that is so essential for, for each of the sites, for the sites together, working together, and for the success of the, of the labor. Thank you. What should I repeat? <laughs> Poor. Yes, I understand that this very conclusion concerning national coordinators is important. Looking at my ministry, so beautifully represented here, yeah. I'm fully aware that it is really uh, one of the crucial levels and elements of the game. This intermediate, not just to promote the idea, not just to act as go between mechanically just implementing or passing the documents, but promoting the idea, the idea about the values, and be uh, qu very professional at this very level, involving also uh, experts, I mean historians. It is not a secret that Michał, Dr. Wisniewski, is a member, a proud member of our national committee, which creates a certain uh, discussion, dialogue, and finally the output will be seen tomorrow. The place which is nowhere, which is hardly uh, known in Poland, which is the place of a huge European potential, and due to European heritage label, and the wise intermediate, namely national coordinator, has been proposed and is the winner. And the winner visited us even today, the mayor of this small village, and tomorrow he is hosting us. So I'm grateful to you all who are brave enough to join us tomorrow for this adventure. Dear colleagues, it was a very long uh, session and very intensive, but I think it was a very fruitful session as well. And I would like to thank to all of you for uh, participating in this event. We were very intriguing about the results, but I'm sure that we all heard many important information and uh, very important messages from you concerning the networking, concerning the future of European Heritage Label. 
but before the end of this meeting, I have still two very important technical information. And before I uh, give the floor to uh, Agata Wąsowska Pavlik, the ICC director, I just want to say that uh, after this discussion session, uh, we still have two, let's say, uh, workshops or seminars at the front of us, one concerning the UNESCO World Heritage Site, namely the city center of Krakow. And this afternoon we will be guided to the uh, city center, historical center of Krakow. We'll have the guided walking tour. Uh, this is about this very afternoon and evening. And uh, I have one technical question concerning tomorrow. Tomorrow we will leave the city of Krakow 8.15 sharp. The bus will start the tour from the Ibis Hotel where most of you stays. But some of you stays in Hotel Polski and some of you uh, stays in uh, one more Niebieski Hotel. So uh, these of you who stays in the Hotel Polski, please be in the lobby of the hotel 7.45, Marek Świdrak uh, will be there waiting for you and there'll be a, 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 there'll be a car waiting for you as well. So uh, we'll be able to uh, meet together in Ibis Hotel uh, before the bus is leaving. And uh, me personally, I'll be in Niebieski Hotel waiting for these of you who stays in this very hotel. Please let us meet 7.45 and we will take a tram to go to Ibis Hotel. It's not so far away, but anyway, we'll, uh, we'll take the tram uh, to, 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 to go to Ibis. And from this very place, we will go to Łużna. But on the way to Łużna Pustki, uh, the European Heritage Label, one of four European Heritage Labels that we have in Poland, we'll have also some other stops. But I guess that tomorrow on the way, there'll be much more time to discuss everything what we prepared for you. And now I would like to pass the voice to Agata Wąsowska Pavlik, the director of the International Cultural Center in Krakow. Well, so in the very end, I must say, it is always a great satisfaction when the meeting ends and uh, we see uh, people's faces uh, a little bit tired, but, I, but also happy and uh, I, it is a great satisfaction for me that you came and that uh, you prove that uh, such meeting uh, has sense. Because uh, as I told you in the very beginning, we were asked quite frequently, why are we doing this? And uh, the, 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 our, our answer was, because we think it is necessary. And uh, uh, that's all in this uh, topic. I would like to thank you all for coming to Krakow and visiting us, and I hope you will, uh, you will, uh, the memory of this stay, the memory, the memory of uh, this visit, this conference uh, will be very vivid, and that we will be able to meet again on another occasions, on another conferences that we will be organizing in the frame of not just a year, but other uh, activities. Next year, we are organizing a heritage forum of Central Europe dedicated to the issue of heritage and environment. So the call will be uh, opened very soon. Uh, I would like to thank you once again for the coming. And I would like to thank all of you for contributions, especially our panelists and experts. Uh, I, now this is a proper time to thank my team who worked very hard for the last uh, half a year to prepare this meeting. I would like to thank Anna Kempińska, Marek Świdrak, Michał Wiśniewski and Łukasz Galusek, uh, my deputy, for uh, making this event uh, possible. Uh, I would like also to thank our two voluntarily uh, people, uh, Gabrysia and Adam, who also helped us uh, during uh, this, uh, this meeting. And last but not least, our translators who uh, work hard during those two days uh, to, 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 to make the communication easy for those who are not following very quickly in, uh, in English. So, uh, once again, it was a very, very intensive time, but very um, 
uh, full of content and uh, in the frame of European Year of Cultural Heritage, uh, I think what is really needed is this critical uh, approach to all what we are doing, not just in the frame of European, uh, European Heritage Label. Uh, because the world is changing and there, is, uh, sh there are shifts in many areas and we, uh, people responsible for, um, for passing the heritage to the future generations, we have to also uh, always think of how to uh, go out of the box, which was very uh, rightly pointed by uh, Miss Sarah uh, this morning. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And have a nice evening with uh, the guided tour in Krakow, and we'll see each other tomorrow. Not all of you, but those who are going with us uh, on a trip, we will see each other tomorrow uh, in the bus. From our experience, uh, as the ICC is organizing many touring scientific, scientific seminars in Central Europe, this is the best format to really to uh, fill the place and to understand. Because what uh, knowing, reading is not the same as uh, uh, experiencing. So let's experience Uzna Pustki and the beautiful south of Poland tomorrow together. See you then.